Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, this talk on how not to write device drivers. Um, skip that. Uh, I'm, if you don't know me already, I've uh, been working in embedded Linux for many years, and you can catch up with me uh, at these places. But the important thing then is that today I want to be talking about uh, device drivers and how to do it in user space. So I'll begin by talking a little bit about uh, device drivers in kernel space, just to give the background. Uh, and then we'll talk about user space device drivers. And I'll follow up with some examples using GPIOs, pulse width modulation, and I squared C. So the conventional uh, driver model is that uh, all the hardware is accessed via the kernel. So if you want to access some hardware, you have to write a kernel device driver uh, that exposes some kind of interface within uh, the, 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 at the user level. And then applications way up here. Can you see that? No, you can't. Applications somewhere way up here can then call uh, the kernel system interfaces. The kernel then accesses the hardware on your behalf. Uh, down here in the kernel, you can handle things like interrupts and also do fancy things with DMA and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, and then the interface between the kernel and the application is uh, well, basically through files. As we know, in Linux, everything is a file, uh, except network interfaces, which are sockets, but that's almost a file. So, most of the time when you're writing user applications, you interact with the device, whatever it is, uh, via the POSIX function calls, I open, close, read, write, etc. And the files you are accessing are going to be uh, usually either device nodes, that's the stuff in the slash dev directory, um, or we can also expose attributes via the sysfs interface, via slash sys, uh, whatever. So, for example, um, we'll look at, at the moment in uh, at the GPIO, and uh, you can access GPIOs through slash sys, slash class, slash GPIO. So this is, the, uh, this is the normal way of doing things. So, writing kernel uh, device drivers is a lot of fun. H hands up who has written device drivers for kernel before? Yeah, pretty much everybody. So, I mean, it's great fun. I really, really enjoy that. Um, but it is a little time consuming. Uh, you are working within a kernel environment, which is quite a lot different to uh, a normal programming environment. And it has the problem that if you introduce a bug in a kernel driver, then you can crash the entire kernel and bring the entire system to a halt. So bugs in kernel code are much more serious than bugs in user space. So the reason for this presentation really is to say that if possible, it would be good if we didn't have to write uh, kernel device drivers, both because it takes a, a, a certain amount of time and effort, but mostly because it introduces uh, points of failure into your system. So I want to encourage you when you are accessing hardware to think, can I do this from user space? Do I really need a kernel device driver to do this thing? If you can do it from user space, then do so. That is safer and easier um, for everyone. Um, note about device trees. So since we're talking uh, mostly to an embedded audience here, um, you'll be aware that uh, if you're working on ARM platforms and, and several other platforms as well, in order to access the hardware, uh, the, you'll need to tell the kernel where the hardware is, and you do that through a device tree. So as a part of this, but I'm not actually going to go into this because that's kind of too much in, uh, detail for this, uh, this session, but as part of this exercise, you still need to write uh, the device tree or the device tree overlay to give the kernel access to the particular bit of hardware you're trying to uh, get to. Uh, 
So I'm going to start with uh, GPIOs, general purpose input output. Um, so these are the most basic level of digital I.O. On, uh, on a system. There are a bunch of pins that we can configure for inputs and outputs. And as outputs, we can use them to control um, lights, relays. Uh, we can control other chip selects and various other things. And then as inputs, we can use it to read the state of a digital input, which could be a switch or a button or um, something else. And uh, when we read them as inputs, we can either read them in polled mode, we can just keep on reading the, the input uh, and see what it is, or uh, in most cases, on most modern SOCs, we can configure the GPIOs to generate an interrupt. And uh, the interfaces we're going to be looking at allow us to, uh, to wait for that interrupt so we don't have to keep on polling. Um, you have the luxury at the moment of having two interfaces, two user space interfaces, two GPIOs. Uh, we have the old GPIO lib interface. Um, it's not a library, by the way, it's a kernel driver. Um, so GPIO lib has been around for quite some time. It exists as a SysFS uh, interface. The great thing about it is it's scriptable. It's just a bunch of files. You can write shell script or whatever to access those files. So it's nice and easy. But it has a few problems. Um, in particular, um, it doesn't handle interrupts particularly well. Uh, and there can be issues with if you want to change more than one in input or output at the same time. So we have, in, uh, in addition then, the GPIO CDEV interface. Uh, which is the, the modern, better way of accessing GPIOs. But since it uses IOCTL functions, as we'll see in a moment, uh, you have to write uh, uh, some uh, code to do that. You can't script it. So starting off then with the GPIO lib sysfs interface. Um, so first of all, looking in the... Uh, no, it's still not working. Uh, looking in sysclass GPIO, you'll see a number of registers called GPIO chips, something or other. So each one of those, uh, each one of those uh, directories rather, represents a GPIO register. Uh, typically, as in this case here, uh, the registers are 32 bits each, and we have four of them. Uh, this actually is from uh, a BeagleBone. And we can then, uh, we have these two files called export and unexport. So you can write a number to the export file and that will export a GPIO to user space, which you can then uh, access. And then when you're done with it, you can unexport it by writing the same number to the unexport file. Now these numbers are a linear range, well, there are a range of numbers, starting, usually starting from zero and going up to the, the maximum number, number of GPIOs you have. So in the example here, GPIO chip zero, this register will have the first 32 GPIOs numbered from zero to 31. And then GPIO chip 32 will have the next bunch numbered 32 uh, to 63, and so on and so on. This is a slight pest because it means you have to convert uh, the, normally when you look at the schematics, uh, you will see uh, the, the, the schematics label uh, the GPIOs as the GPIO re register and then the, 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 uh, the bit within that register. So you have to convert that uh, GPIO chip and register number into a linear GPIO range. Uh, looking within the GPIO chip uh, directory, uh, you can see there are a bunch of files. The important ones are one called base, which tells you the first GPIO number occurring in this register. Uh, so we're looking at GPIO chip zero on the, on the screen, so base will contain zero. Uh, NGPIO tells you how many GPIO pins there are in this register, 32 in this case. And then label is a arbitrary label uh, to identify this thing. And in the case of this particular SOC, you will see that it 
is just the name of the chip. It will be GPIO chip zero. So then if we want to export, um, say, pin 42, which would be the 10th pin on the second GPIO chip, uh, you just write 42 to the export file, and then you see that magically GPIO 42 has appeared as a subdirectory, assuming that's possible. If, if the GPIO is already being used by, for example, something within the kernel, then the export will fail. But assuming it is a free GPIO that we can export to user space, that will succeed. And then if you look within that new directory, you get the access to the GPIOs. So there are a bunch of things in here as well. The important things here are a file called uh, direction, uh, which can be either output or in, sorry, out or in for an output or an input. It defaults to an input. And then we have uh, the file called value, which represents the value of, of the level of the, of the pin. So uh, if it's an input, when we read value, we read the, the level of the pin, one for high, zero for low. And when it's an output, we can write one or zero to value, and that sets the output to be either high or low. And then we have this file called active low, which we can set to one to invert that logic. So it turns out the hardware engineers get a bit confused about high voltages and low voltages. Quite often they get it wrong. So in order to get it right again, you can flip active low uh, by setting a one to that, which means that when you write a one to it, if it's an output, uh, it goes low. And when you write a zero to it, it goes high. OK, good. Uh, next thing, uh, interrupts. So if you want to monitor an input, um, you can just poll it, but that's inefficient. So if the GPIO hardware underneath can, uh, can uh, uh, generate interrupts on a level change, then we will have this extra file called edge. And we can write to that to indicate how we want to generate the interrupt. So edge can be non, meaning we don't generate any interrupts, or rising or falling, rise, uh, or, or both. So we can interrupt on a rising edge, a falling edge, or both of those. So in the example on the slide, I'm writing the string falling to uh, GPIO 60 slash edge. That will then give me an interrupt on a falling edge. And then, um, unfortunately, you can't uh, you can't use the interrupt mechanism from a script. You need to actually write a bit of code, and you need to poll. And there's some examples on my website, but not on the slides, uh, which show you how to do that. But essentially, you call the poll function. That will block until the interrupt comes along. When the interrupt comes along, you unblock, and then you read the value and find out what it was. OK, so that's the uh, GPIO lib interface. Uh, the GPIO CDEV interface uh, achieves uh, a similar thing, but using uh, nodes in slash dev. So when you enable this, you'll find that in slash dev, you have GPIO chip 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. So each one of those nodes in, in uh, slash dev represents a GPIO register similar to uh, the GPIO chip directory in SysFS. The difference then is that there are no subdirectories. So GPIO chip um, is a, uh, a character node, character device node. And so it doesn't have a structure within it. You have to open it. And then you can use IOCTL functions to access uh, the pins. Why, so this is actually more complicated, it's more coding uh, to do simple things at least. What are the advantages? Well, first of all, it has the naming scheme uh, that's more accurate, re accurately reflects uh, what you'll see on the schematic. So we name them now using the, the register, GPIO chip, one, two, three, et cetera, and then we number the pins within that, exactly as you will see on the hardware diagrams. Um, 
And also, since we are treating the register as a single entity, you can actually do several transactions in one single function call. So we can set a number of bits, for example, uh, in one function call, and we can do that without glitching. Whereas with the uh, GPIO lib interface, you could only change one uh, input or output at a time. Sorry, you can only change one output at a time, I should say. Um, and the way it handles interrupts is a little, little nicer as well. So I'm not going to go through every single uh, aspect of this because it's quite a complicated uh, programming interface. Um, so I'll just give a, uh, a, a, some demo code uh, that gives the basic idea. Uh, so this bit of code is going to be uh, writing to GPIO chip 1, um, pin 21, which is an LED if you have a beagle bone black. So the first lot is just uh, the various include files you need and uh, the variables. The interesting stuff is on the next slide. <clears throat> so here we open GPIO chip one. Uh, the next line we set the line offsets to be 21. Remember that's the pin we wanted, 121. Uh, set the flags, so we want this to be an output because we're going to use it to control an LED. Uh, default values, so initially we're going to set it to zero. And consumer label, we can actually give a human readable string, uh, or at least a, a meaningful string, a meaningful label to these GPIO pins, um, which helps with debugging and, and, and such like. And then the last line, we have a uh, number of lines we want is one. So having created that uh, request structure, we then do the I IOCTL, get line handle IOCTL. So this is a little bit of magic because this will return a new file descriptor, a new handle, if you like, for this request. So we can now use, uh, it actually uh, uh, returns in, in the request structure in the FD field. So then if you look at the IOCTL down here, um, we are using that file descriptor then to change the state of this GPIO pin. Okay, and we could do this multiple times. We could uh, have uh, different file descriptors for different groups of, uh, of pins on this GPIO. And as you can see where we have line offsets up here, um, the fact it is line offsets is, is, is an array. So we can actually create a file descriptor handle which represents more than one pin. So as I say, we can then uh, manipulate several pins in one go in a single function call so we atomically change those outputs without any glitches. So it's a nicer interface from a technical viewpoint, uh, but there's a bit more coding involved to make it work. You can also, um, so the, the GPIO CDEV has an event mechanism which is tied into uh, the uh, GPIO interrupt mechanism. Um, I haven't got an, an example of that code, uh, but there's plenty around. So using that, we can then listen on an event. Uh, we can use poll or select to wait for the event to happen, and then we handle the event. Alrighty, so GPIO, that's the, that's the fun stuff. Um, the next few things, so, so I need to look at uh, pulse width modulation, and I need to look at uh, I squared C, and then I need to make a few uh, summing up remarks. So pulse width modulation isn't, isn't so um, often used perhaps as GPIOs, uh, but pretty much every SOC has some PWM PWM circuits. And uh, essentially the idea of a pulse width modulation is that you can create a pulse train, as shown at the top of the slide there, where you have a period for the pulse and a duty cycle, which is the percentage of the period essentially that the, uh, the level is high. And then by modifying the duty cycle, uh, you can change it from 0%, which means it's permanently off, to 100%, which means it's permanently on, so you can do the full range. And it's used, uh, the two uh, common use cases for PWMs are dimmable LEDs, including backlights, 
So as you change the, the, the duty cycle, uh, the LED will be brighter or dimmer. And the second uh, case is for servo motors. Uh, typical, typically, servo motors are controlled by a pulse width modulated chain, and the deflection of the servo motor is controlled by the duty cycle. So this is kind of useful. Uh, it's fairly simple to, uh, to program. Um, again, there is, in this case, just one interface, and it's a SysFS interface, very similar to the uh, GPIO lib interface. So if we look in sysclass PWM, uh, you will see that, okay, there's a slide missing here actually, you will see that there are a number of PWM chips, one for each PWM, PWM interface. Some PWM interfaces can handle multiple channels. So here I'm looking inside PWM chip zero. Again, this is actually from uh, a BeagleBone. And if we look within, within inside the PWM chip, uh, you can see that uh, there is, <laughs> uh, my, my arrow needs to move along a little bit actually. There are two files called export and unexport. So move that uh, mentally along a little bit. The arrow should be pointing to the export. So we can write uh, the uh, PWM number to export and that will then export it. And unexport works in, in reverse. Um, there is also a file there called npwm, which says how many PWM interfaces we have for this PWM chip. And in the case of this particular chip, which again is the BeagleBone, uh, this uh, PWM's PWM chip zero actually supports two PWM channels. So I can write either one or uh, zero or one to export. So let's go ahead and export uh, channel zero. And we find then that we get a new directory for this PWM interface called P PWM zero. And if you look within that, we have the controls necessary to control uh, the period and the duty cycle. And there's a flag to enable it or, or disable it. So initially it will be disabled, which means it's not actually running. Uh, we can then set the period uh, in nanoseconds and the duty cycle, so that's the on part of the period, also in nanoseconds. Oh, and there's a file there also called polarity. Uh, we can set polarity to one, which means that it flips it round. So um, during the, uh, the on period, uh, it will be low and during the off period, it will be high. So it just inverts the waveform. Uh, so we can do this from the command line or from a script. Uh, so in this case, supposing I want a PWM uh, with a one millisecond period and a 50% duty cycle. So uh, one millisecond turns out to be a million nanoseconds. So we write one million to the period and we want it to be 50% on, 50% off. So we write 500,000 uh, nanoseconds to duty cycle. This means the thing will be yeah, half on and half off. And then we write one to the enable file uh, and that sets the whole thing running. Okay, so again, that's fairly simple to do from user space. And then the last thing I'm gonna finish, uh, I'm gonna talk about is gonna be uh, I squared C. So this is uh, inherently more complicated. Uh, I squared C is a simple serial bus uh, two wire bus, um, usually used to connect uh, uh, sensor devices, uh, small EEPROMs, um, maybe uh, control devices like touch screens, although they usually use SPI. So with I squared C, it is a bus. So you have a bus controller, which is uh, part, usually part of the SOC. And uh, then on the bus, you have a number of peripherals uh, the peripherals have a seven-bit address, uh, usually hardwired. So when you buy a, a, an I2C chip, the data sheet tells you which address it is using. Uh, 
Commonly, there are two or maybe four addresses you can choose from by, by linking various wires together. Um, if you have a problem with uh, a conflict where you have two um, I squared C devices with the same address, well, um, you can put, put them on different buses. Most systems have uh, several I squared C bus controllers. So you can put them onto separate uh, I squared C buses, or, well, <laughs> or you can go and buy a different chip. Um, the way the addressing works is a little bit odd. Uh, so we have 128 uh, addresses from a 7-bit address, uh, but a bunch of them are reserved by the, uh, the, the bus mechanic or the bus electrics. So it turns out you only really have 112 nodes per bus. So accessing this from uh, user space, you can do this by enabling the uh, C dev, sorry, the I squared C dev uh, driver within the kernel, and that will expose uh, in the dev directory a device node for each of the uh, master <coughs> bus controllers. So you might see something like this. Uh, so here we have um, two, bus, two controllers on bus zero and bus one. And then as before, you can access them using open, close, read and write. But most of the time, you use, the I, uh, use some IOCTL functions to actually initiate I, I squared C transactions. Uh, the structures you'll need to do all this stuff are defined in that I2C dev .h file. Um, just as an illustration of a couple of things you can do, um, so there is a package called I squared C tools which help you in debugging uh, these things. So this is an, an example of using I squared C detect uh, on a bus and it's printing out, so essentially it does a probe uh, to every possible address and then prints out uh, the results. So in this case here, there is uh, a device at address 39. Uh, and there are also a bunch of uh, things at 53 to 57. But they're marked with a UU, so that means they are already used uh, by the kernel. So we cannot access uh, those, uh, th those addresses from uh, user space. <coughs> Um, in point of fact, since again this is from a BeagleBone, uh, those addresses are the um, I squared C uh, EE proms that are used by the BeagleBone, which contain various IDs and such like. But they're handled internally within the kernel. We can't, without some fiddling around, access them from user space. Um, so anyhow, so we have a device, an unhandled device at address 39. Um, so, again, from the command line, we can use uh, there's an I squared C get and an I squared C set uh, command. So we can use this for simple diagnostics and uh, simple use cases. So with I squared C get, we give it the bus we want to talk to, uh, the chip address, and then the register on that chip. So in my example here, it turns out that the, um, uh, the chip at uh, address 39 is actually a ambient light sensor, which I bought from Adafruit one time. Um, and reading through the data sheet from this, we can see that register 8A contains uh, the, uh, actually contains the ID. So we can check that we have the right chip and the right version of the chip by reading the ID register at 0x8a, and it com comes back with 50, and then I look in the data sheet and it says, yes, 50 indicates this is the right chip. So we can use I squared C get uh, to read any 8-bit register. Um, in a similar way, we can use I squared C set to change a register value, um, I, squared C's, I squared C set, the bus, the chip, the register, and then the value. 
Um, if so you can do a certain amount uh, using I squared C, get and set. Uh, you can do more, con uh, more complicated control of the, of the chip by using the IOCTL functions. So we can use, um, oh sorry, Th this example code here is showing how to read uh, a, oh no, sorry, we're writing a register. Um, uh, say that again. So actually, the, the, this code is, is reading. So we're opening the, the bus I squared C dash one. Uh, we're selecting through the IOCTL. Uh, we want to talk to ch um, chip 39. And then actually, we are doing a, uh, a read of the ID register, which is at 0x8a. Um, it turns out that the way that I squared C works, in actual fact, it's, you have to do a write and then a read. It's basically uh, a, a loop. So you have to write the value and then read the read, read sorry write the register value out and then you read the contents of the register back. Alrighty, so there are three examples of systems of increasing complexity from GPIOs, which are comparatively simple, PWMs, slightly more simple, uh, slightly more complicated maybe, and then with I squared C you can do quite complicated stuff. But again doing it without having to touch the kernel. There are similar uh, interfaces, generic drivers for SPI, for USB, um, and also a bunch of others I should have mentioned. Uh, so for example, if you are using GPIOs as, um, if you have a bunch of GPIO buttons to control um, the user interface or something, there's a whole GPIO buttons uh, subsystem which will map a, a, a button, a key press, uh, sorry, a button press into a, a, key, a key code, which you can then handle within your user interface. So we have GPIO buttons. Uh, we have also the LED subsystem. So my example was uh, using the GPIO level to access the LED. Uh, there's actually a whole uh, um, sys class LED subsystem which does more sophisticated things with LEDs. Um, and then you can also go drop, you can, you can go also go still further by using the user-defined IO subsystem. So this is very generic. It allows you to create, again, from user space, uh, a program that completely accesses the hardware. So using the UIO uh, framework, you can map the registers of the, the piece of hardware into uh, the application memory address space. Uh, you can also write a little stub uh, kernel function which will handle uh, interrupts. And then you can actually do the majority of the handling in user space. Um, so this is, the, the main use case for this seems to be uh, FPGAs. If you haven't if you create an FPGA, you will inevitably be, be creating some kind of uh, interface uh, through that piece of hardware. And the simplest way to access, access that uh, from user space is to use the UIO subsystem uh, to access your bunch of registers that are exposed on the FPGA. What are you missing by not writing a kernel device driver? Um, so there are some things. There are, there are reasons that kernel device drivers exist in the first place. Um, there are uh, a couple of things to do with robustness and performance. Uh, so it is perhaps uh, a worry to you that if you are handling a uh, device from user space, uh, a user, user space program can be killed and terminated, whereas there's no way to kill or terminate a, a kernel device driver except by terminating the entire kernel, of course. So it is maybe smart, um, you could be regarded as being more robust uh, to put uh, the code into the kernel for that reason. Um, also within the kernel, we have a lot of uh, sophisticated um, locking uh, techniques from spin locks, mutexes, read-write locks, and uh, the read-copy-write update uh, mechanism. So you can do, if you have uh, highly contended um, locking uh, scenarios, you can do those better in the kernel than you can in user space. Uh, 
Uh, and also you have more direct access, access to the hardware. So you can do fancy things with memory addresses and DMAs and such like. And then finally, and probably the, the biggest reason to write uh, kernel device drivers in the first place is that there are a whole bunch of subsystems within the kernel which you can just slot in another device driver to, to cover. So a simple example of this is the backlight, the LCD backlight. Uh, it's usually uh, a PWM channel that controls that. Um, so you could quite easily control it from user space using the PWM uh, user space mechanism we just talked about. But in fact, there is another subsystem, uh, the backlight subsystem, uh, which exposes a different user interface uh, via SysFS. Uh, and if you want to expose your uh, LCD backlight using that standard interface, you would have to write some kernel code to do that. Okie dokie, and that is everything I have to say on the subject right now. So we have a couple of minutes, uh, literally three minutes uh, spare for questions. So um, if you, if you uh, want to ask a question, can I encourage you to come and use the microphones here so that uh, the question is recorded uh, on, the, uh, on the video that's been made? But yes, anybody have any questions or comments on uh, uh, not writing kernel device drivers? <laughs> I'm afraid it's a long walk. Is this working? Yeah. Seems to. Uh, how, what progress has been made on being able to access DMA from user space? Because we were interested in our company for that kind of task, but there didn't seem to be anything very stable yet. There was some movement in that area, but not a... So which interfaces did you, did you look at? Oh, I can't remember which one it was we were looking at. There was something that exposed setting up a DMA channel from a user task. But it, was, it wasn't uh, an official thing yet. Yeah, so accessing uh, DMA channels directly from user space is kind of tricky uh, because the DMA channel is, sorry, the DMA hardware is, is, is very specific to uh, an application, to, to a, a, a chip. And the way the memory is allocated and the mem way memory addresses are handled is also very system specific. So I would guess. Uh, well, okay. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any standardized way of accessing DMA channels from user space. And I would guess that there would not be such a thing because it is kind of tricky and device specific. So there may be particular examples in particular, uh, uh, particular board support packages, but I, I don't expect to find a generic one. Right. Thanks. Okay. Hello. Hi. Talking about GPIOs, have you looked at uh, libgpio-d, which is a tool that exposes for the character driver uh, sets of functions that you can either script or have either bindings in C or Python to code upon? Yeah, uh, so that's a good point. Um, the way I describe the interface is, is that you write the IOCTLs directly in your, in, your, in your code to control either GPIOs or I2C or whatever. There are, in many cases, uh, libraries that will help you do this, uh, including uh, libgpio-d, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is, uh, gives you a high level abstraction and is easier to code to. So in fact, I would actually recommend you would use uh, one, a library such as that. Uh, I just didn't really have time to delve into that in the slides. It's also upstream now, so. It's? It's also upstream in the kernel, so we can build it and use it. Okay, oh cool, right, I didn't know that, good. Okay, maybe time for one more question. I think we're coming to the end of our slot. Ah, Michael. You know, in the Raspberry Pi world, there are lots of Python libraries for, for doing stuff in user space. You never change your kernel. Yep. Any, any experiment on other platforms? Like, I, I guess it's portable, it writes this, works the same way on Bigabon Black, for example. Well, any usefulness on that? It would be nice if there was. Um, 
so certainly the, uh, the Raspberry Pi and the BeagleBone also has BoneScript, which does something very similar. Uh, so these, these platforms are highly scriptable using Python or JSON or whatever uh, scripting language you like. Um, I, I don't know of very much effort to port that to other more deeply embedded platforms. Um, so in my experience at least, uh, if you get a, um, uh, a single board computer or, or a system on module from one of the many vendors of these things, they don't come with Python support very much. They don't come with, with uh, fully scripted whatever. So it would be nice if they, if they were to, and maybe as the Raspberry Pi concept continues to roll through, people will start doing this more. Um, but yeah, it would make the life, it would, would make our lives a lot easier if we could just write everything uh, in Python code. Okay, uh, I think we're pretty much out of time now, so uh, if anybody has any remaining questions, um, um, grab me as, uh, as, as we finish this, this session. Uh, but meanwhile, thank you all very much for, uh, for coming along to this, and I hope it's been useful. <laughs>